Good morning. Welcome to another installment of our virtual seminar Grove. And I am really excited. I'm excited about all of these, aren't I, Richard? Uh, I'm really excited for this one uh, because uh, we're going to talk to a group of what I call really unsung heroes, people who I have the fortune of working with and seeing on a regular basis, but you as patrons do not know these people. And they they are not the four horsemen of the apocalypse. They are actually a really, really amazing team, and you get to meet them, which is why we came up with that fancy name. What was it? Dimmers, Transducers, and Lamps. Oh, my. Uh, we're brought to you today by the Cedar City Brian Head and Tourism Bureau, so we're grateful for their sponsorship here. We would like you to ask questions via Facebook. You can do that, and we'll get to those in about uh, 40 minutes. But until then, we're going to have a beautiful conversation. Who have we got here, Richard? Thanks, Michael. Uh, yes, we're super excited today to, to get some of our backstage folks, the people who make the magic happen, out in front of you so you can meet them and learn what they do. Uh, helping me host today is uh, Danielle Davis, our um, assistant electrics director. And uh, she's going to help with working uh, to ask some of these questions. Um, uh, but also joining us today are some of our seasonal staff members, people who've worked with us over the years and uh, helped us to produce the plays that you all enjoy. Um, just a brief introduction, then I'm going to have them talk a little bit about themselves. But uh, first off, we have um, uh, Adam Visconti. He um, graduated with a BA in theater, uh, emphasis in design and technology, uh, and a minor in creative media and film. So we'll get to hear what all those different parts mean. Um, most recently, he was an audio engineer at USF in the 2019 season. Um, he went on national tour, Finding Neverland, right, um, as the assistant audio and assistant video technician. And uh, now he's lighting and sound coordinator for the St. Paul School in Baltimore, Maryland. Hello, Adam. I see. <laughs> um, also joining us today, we've got uh, Ryan Turpin. Um, Ryan's done a lot of things with us. He's also a graduate of SUU, so the Theater Arts and Dance program there. He started out with USF. Um, uh, in the fellowship program, uh, worked on Into the Woods. Uh, he was a audio uh, front of house mix person for Green Show, a uh, couple years in the Randall, mixing uh, musicals there. Became an audio supervisor. He was a um, tour technician for our educational tour. Um, and now he's living in California, right? Um, welcome. Nice to see you, Ryan. Yeah. And also with us is Kate Morton. Um, Kate, and, uh, Kate was, uh, she works as a master electrician and sort of tour lighting designer and uh, technical director, right? Um, graduated from Stephen F. Austin State University in 2016 uh, with a Bachelor of Arts in Technical Theater. Um, started at the festival as a lighting technician and through the seasons became crew chief uh, in the electrics department. Um, thank you, Kate, for being with us today. Um, so just to, just to kick things off, you know, I want to hear a little bit about how each of you got into theater. How did you start doing this kind of stuff? Um, Adam, can you start us off? Can you tell us how, how did you come to theater? Sure. So uh, my parents always took me to theater productions when I was a kid, just like little local things around. Um, but when I myself kind of delved into it, I was in seventh grade and my social studies teacher uh, came up to me and he was like, hey, my church is doing a production of Godspell. Do you want to come like do lighting design for it? And I said, yes. And I had no idea the Godspell was a musical. I had no idea what a lighting designer was. I was just like, that sounds fun. Um, and it was all downhill from there. No, um, but, <laughs> um, but uh, that's kind of how I got into it. And he, um, place me because I also had him for my eighth grade year into uh, the technical theater courses in high school and I had an internship in between my sophomore and junior year of high school um, out in Pennsylvania at a place called Millbrook Playhouse and I was working like 13 hour days unpaid back when you know that was an acceptable thing and uh, we um, I, my, my mom uh, was like yes this will make him not want to do theater like these, these long hours like maybe like deter me away and, and I would come out every day and be like oh we just had the coolest day today um, and that was kind of my first exposure to like oh this is something I can do for the rest of my life um, so that's kind of how I, I slipped in. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny how, how many folks go, my parents thought I would do this theater thing and then find out I, like, I would get it out of my system. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's like, no, this is, a, this is a real career. There are many ways to do many different things in it. And I have a very similar story. So thanks for sharing that. I think 
we, we may hear similar things from other folks. But Kate, could you tell us a little bit about how, how did you come to theater and to the work you do? Yeah, so I started in high school. I was in the intro to theater class, ninth grade. <laughs> um, and sports didn't really appeal to me <laughs> as a person. So I ended up going to the after school theater activities while my parents were at work and we did everything. We were a small high school, so everyone did all the things. <laughs> um, but when I first went to college, I definitely tried to go into nursing, <laughs> made it one year <laughs> and went, I'm miserable. I started taking theater classes again. I was like, yep, this is, this is what I'm supposed to do. And so starting a community college and then going to SFA, I kind of narrowed myself down and found that I really liked lighting. And I've just kind of been going ever since then on that path. <laughs> yeah. cool. can, can you tell me, it sounds like you had a, a educational opportunities in, in your secondary education. So in, in high school and stuff, is that, did, did that make a big impact on you? Like the theater you did in, in high school? How did, how did that work at your school? Um, depends on what part of high school you're asking about. <laughs> <laughs> Loaded question, right? Um, no, it, it sounds uh, like you did some, you had some theater training and stuff at that level as well, right? Yeah, so in high school, um, two of my years I had a theater teacher that was very much a carpenter. Mm -hmm. And so he really helped us learn how you build a set, how you make it safe, especially if it's two stories, how you brace things and those types of things. And then the year after that, I had a teacher that was very much stage management and more lighting centered, which is where I kind of started narrowing myself down. Mm -hmm. And she was very much, uh, oh, you want to learn this? Well, here's a manual. Here's this piece of equipment. <laughs> come to me in 30 minutes with your questions and kind of started that teach yourself always be learning there's not always going to be someone to hold your hand process when I was still a little baby <laughs> which I think has helped me long term because you always run into things you know nothing about <laughs> right thank you um Ryan yeah tell us about your journey to to theater um, well, I guess it started when I was about 11. I did a community theater show. Uh, my brother was going to be in it, so my parents were like, well, that's a good thing for Ryan to do. We're going to put him in it as well. So I was basically just pulling a curtain and had like a little walk-on roll at the end. It was the sound of music, so you know, whatever. Uh, but I was mostly pulling a curtain, and I remember being backstage, and it was in a uh, what was uh, at one point in the county uh, an old high school that was now a middle school and it was built in uh, 1951 and it had its old original uh, hub electric uh, radio alarm dimmer and I remember looking at it and I'm like that looks cool I want to know how to use that um, and so that's what kind of started me down the path of, of technical um, then when I got into high school, my theater teacher one day uh, at the beginning of my 11th grade year, he goes, hey, Ryan, you know how to run sound, right? And I go, mm, yeah, sure, I'll go with that. <laughs> um, so I ended up mixing uh, our musical of Jane Eyre. And um, basically at that point, I'm like, sound is really fun. There are so many things to go wrong. I like this. So that's where I kind of kept going with it. And, you know, up to that point, I wasn't thinking about going into theater uh, uh, for my life. I was, I, I think I wanted to be a dentist uh, at that point, says the kid who never wore his retainer. But um, yeah, so just kind of my background. That's great. Okay, tell everybody just real quick, what, what is a hub electric <laughs> So uh, So hub is a company that went on a business, I think, I think in the 70s, if I remember correctly, um, and uh, they were they were a really large uh, supplier of uh, lights and uh, dimmer systems and everything like that. And so, what these radio alarm dimmers look like, if if you've ever seen um, any version of Frankenstein, like uh, it it looks like you're bringing Frankenstein's monster to life. You have these gigantic levers that you just pull down, and a lot of times you're grabbing multiple ones and just like jumping and just writing them down to change the lights and everything like that. And so it's it's great fun. It works a lot more like the dimmers in your house do than what uh, the dimmers that we uh, use now in theater today do. Very cool. Thank you. I have a question uh, that I'd like everybody, including Danielle, to talk about, too, that Kate spawned. Um, 
I have been a product and a victim of the, here's a manual, read and find out and come back a half hour from now if you have any questions. Is that a normal training behavior um, among this technical world? Because uh, because uh, I've heard Danielle tell similar stories where you know she's just had to look it up and research it. So I mean, a lot of times that knowledge uh, is you finding that out. Is that similar? I'm seeing nodding heads all the way around. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. So. I don't know uh, it's a learning tool like it's it's kind of a self-preservation thing like when you hit something that you don't know you you want to figure it out and have intelligent questions to ask before you go to your boss and be like hey i have no idea what i'm doing <laughs> so you kind of try to educate yourself a little bit as you can and then go ask questions <laughs> cool great and then there's the side of it where, as as the boss, you don't know either, and you're just hoping that uh, that your technician can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so in that same sort of vein, um, as far as training, I mean, this is a really broad, you know, statement here. But what what skills, you know, help you like? as you've developed here and become, you know, it got to the level you're at, what skills did you really need to develop and what kind of training did you think was necessary for, um, you know, that maybe even things that you were surprised that you really needed to know. Um, Ryan, do you want to, do you want to take this one to start? You want to try? All right. So I missed part of that question oh, because my kid, my connection went unstable. So oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know it has something to do with training. Mm -hmm. That's about all I know. <laughs> Great. So skills and training that you needed to pursue that you that you practiced uh to get you know to get the skills you have now to to do this work and if there's anything that surprised you you know if you want to highlight something it's like i didn't think i needed to know this but wow i use this all the time yeah i think uh as far as that last bit goes uh things that uh, when at least I was in high school uh, that I didn't think I'd need to know for technical theater that I use just about on a daily basis is uh, networking. And I don't mean like networking as in, I need to meet this person. I mean networking as in, here's a network switch, here's some ethernet cables, here's some equipment, make it all talk. That was one thing that I didn't really think that I would need to know. And even when I started realizing that I was going to need to know some of it, I thought I'd just need to know very bare minimum of it, basically plug it in in basic IP structure. And then when uh, I was there for the opening of um, all the, um, uh, yeah, the Ingolstadt and the Ains and everything like that, then when that came about, um, there's a lot of information learned real fast about uh, networking because there was just, there were things that we were doing that no one had really tried to do before that was theoretically uh, possible for our equipment but you know even when I was having to talk to engineers at Sure and Yamaha and everything like that I would say hey we're running into this and they're like yeah we don't know because no one's really done it before so good luck and it's like cool thanks so basically there's a whole lot of sitting down with me and um, one of the campus uh, IT guys uh, and we were just kind of going through trying to figure out you know trying to find out what worked what didn't work and what we needed to talk to Yamaha about fixing Cool. So, yeah, I mean, that was, that was something that I never thought that I need to know anywhere near what I know now. Yeah. Kate? Um, I mean, I also had that same experience. I didn't realize how much networking I was going to need to know. And I actually ended up going to a community college close to my hometown to be like, please teach me. I just need a couple of classes, <laughs> which has been very helpful. Um, I know some other skills that are nice to have, but I didn't think I would be using them in lighting world is a lot of basic carpentry skills. <laughs> but a lot of those come from we make lights do things they're not originally purpose to do. <laughs> and we have to make it work <laughs> because that's what we do. <laughs> Sweet. Adam? Yeah, I, I think networking is the huge thing. Um, I, I would actually say I recently learned, which is which is kind of cool. There's a 
uh, a system called Dante, um, which has to do with, with audio and networking and everything. And uh, I found out recently that USF has the reputation of having the most complicated Dante system in the US, um, which is uh, pretty cool. Um, <laughs> uh, but I would say also something, not necessarily that I wasn't expecting to have to learn, just not something I initially thought about was basic interpersonal relationship skills. Um, we meet so many people uh, every single day in this industry, whether we're at a rep theater or on tour or anything. Um, and being able to figure out how to communicate with other human beings is crucial uh, <laughs> to make sure we're, we're all on the same page and moving in the same direction. Yeah, I mean, collaborating, communicating. Can, can you talk a little bit about Maybe some of the people that you you have to collaborate with who you're, you know, between designers, other technical staff from other departments, like things like, 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 give me an example, maybe of, uh, uh, of an experience you've had where communication, uh, like broke down. And, and what did you what did you have to do to resolve that? Because maybe you didn't have the information, the whole picture, whatever it was. You want to take that, Adam? Sure. Um, so I, I, for the first part of that question, I guess um, some examples are from an audio side. Um, really everyone, uh, you know, if we're placing speakers on stage, making sure that, you know, it's in the set design that that's even a place that those speakers can go. And then the director making sure we're not blocking people uh, to exit off where there's now a giant speaker in that wing and actors can't exit that way. Um, to front of house management, if there is like a gunshot sound going off um, and a warning that might need to be given for that. Um, like communication is is everywhere across the board. Um, I would say that in terms of uh, communication issues, I think the biggest thing that I've found is it t it, it tends to be um, a lack of information. Uh, in trickle down, you know, we have these hierarchies in the theater system, and sometimes what what is understood at the top, by the time it gets to the technicians, you know, mid tier, we're like, cool, and then we do it, and that is not at all what you know, what the the vision was, what it was supposed to be, um, which is which it gets frustrating, but I think you know once we figure out like, oh, okay, that was just a massive miscommunication here is the proper information we can move forward and fix it and you know it is what it is at that point but i, I would never uh i wouldn't say that i have personally had had a, an interaction where it's been unfixable yeah <laughs> right yeah it's a giant game of telephone you know exactly. nuance is important especially uh as as you as you try to as you're the person at maybe the end of the chain actually implementing whatever it is that's going in there yeah Mm -hmm. um, drawings and, and things we can look at are always helpful. Right? Uh, Danielle, it looks like we might have a question from yeah, I was just going to interject. While we're on the subject of education, Tanya asks, uh, we, we work in a side of theater that deals with technology and science and topics that people don't normally associate with the arts. Um, can you guys talk about how math and science have proven to be important in your jobs as well? <laughs> Kate, what do you think? Um, put very simply, I use math every day. <laughs> um, so especially when we're dealing with lights that are on a set. So like Joseph last full operational season, we had all of those lights going up the staircase. Um, well, all of those LED strips have to get power somehow. Um, which for us ended up being battery packs under the staircase and we just ran wires and tied them up real nice so they didn't get pulled or yanked. But you have to know how much draw, like how much you can pull off of a battery, how long that battery is going to last because they have to last so long with the show. We can't run on stage and change battery <laughs> necessarily. Um, so that's mostly where I use mathematics is figuring out those types of things. Uh, but I also use a lot of technology, like with the networking and stuff that we've talked about, just programming the lights. Um, we have a console. We use ETC brand and um, we tell that console, we're like, we want that light to do this at this point when I hit this button. <laughs> and doing a lot of that, especially going through technology updates and all of that, you learn a lot <laughs> and use it a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of custom sort of 
systems in uh, live performance. We borrow from everything, but it, but the stuff we have to do is very unique. And every time is a unique situation. You know, I, I, I like to tell people that we um, prototype constantly. Like our job is to like do one thing for one show very specifically. We, do, we may run it over and over again for a while, but it's not like making 10,000, you know, Ford cars. You know, we don't get to perfect it to that point. So we have to, we have to be nimble and a lot of problem solving. And every time it's a lot of, um, a lot of the stuff you're talking about, Kate, where it's, you're, you're determining that you're constantly looking at things and making adjustments and, um, and try to keep it going. Um, I want to back up just a little because, um, you know, it's so, it, it, there's so many things that go into the work that you all do and just giving people a sense of like what, like what you're responsible for, what your job title even means when you're doing things. Like, I don't know, like it, it, it can be very daunting. So I just, I, you know, given a, given maybe one job that you've performed uh, with a festival, let's say, just like, what's the scope of the stuff you did? And, and uh, Ryan, I want to, I want you to hit, if you would, first, what is, what is mixing a show? And what does that mean to sort of be uh, in charge of, you know, front of house mix or, or, or whatever. Can you, can you talk about that, those positions? Yeah. So like um, your front of house mix engineer is the person uh, in the Randall that you see sitting in the very back at this little table in the center of the theater that uh, you might ask if they uh, control the air conditioning, but they don't. Um, <laughs> I was asked that multiple times. So I'm like, um, yeah, sure. I'll turn it. I'll turn it up down here and just, <laughs> just grab a fake fader and just slide it because we, we actually can't control the air conditioning in the Randall uh, is, is the truth of it. Um, I probably should have said that. <laughs> anyway, um, so so what you're doing is you're actually, uh, you're controlling the levels uh, of everything that uh, people are hearing, and to some extent, uh, some of the frequencies. We also tune microphones, because you might think that you put a microphone on somebody, and um, it replicates them perfectly uh, every single time. That is not anywhere near true. Um, it doesn't even uh, act the same uh, between actor to actor. I had one actor in green show when i mixed that uh that um uh, he was just it was impossible to get his microphone to sound uh, completely natural and he's a really good actor he's uh, since been on broadway and uh and uh, countless things and been on uh, large national tours for very big uh, productions um and so he's a great actor but it's just it was just hard to get um, a really good natural sound uh, out of his microphone. I struggled with that one uh, for quite a while. And so what you're really doing is you, you're almost like the extra person of the orchestra that no one ever sees because you're really, the main thing that you're doing is you're trying to make the musical um, uh, intelligible. You, you're trying to make it to where the audience can hear it and enjoy it and be able to follow the storyline you know in musical theater so much happens in the music that if you're just kind of you know letting the levels just go as they are um, a lot of the storyline ends up getting lost and so you're trying to make sure that you know this doesn't overpower this and that it's a nice uh nice balance of everything um to to make it to where the uh to where the audience has an enjoyable experience knows what's happening because i've been to many shows where it's gone through a song and then they're onto something completely different. And I'm sitting there going, what happened? I, di I didn't understand anything that just happened there. And so that's what you're kind of doing. You're kind of helping the audience be able to understand the story a little bit more through controlling levels of uh, actors and musicians and everything like that. Yeah. We talked a lot about science and, and math, but there's an art to this. Oh yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, uh, I used to, I used to think uh, a long time ago, like, uh, mixing came pretty naturally to me and I, I think a lot of it was because um, I, I was in band uh, in high school, uh, played trumpet uh, for seven years of my life. Uh, don't ask me to play it now because I haven't picked it up since I graduated so that's been like 13, 14, 15 years ago. So my lips are completely out of shape. Uh, so can't really do it anymore. But that uh, fundamental music education really helps you a lot uh, when mix when mixing. Uh, you know, I, I thought that I could uh, teach mixing to anyone. And there was someone that I worked with one time that he had never uh, played an instrument or anything like that. And, you know, I thought, oh, yeah, you know, this will be fine. It's, it's pretty easy to teach mixing. And I learned that, you know, that fundamental like music background is actually really important because I was having to explain concepts to this guy that I'm like, why do you not know this? <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, so yeah, that's actually really important. You, you really are when you're, um, 
you know, a sound console really basically is a musical instrument that you're playing. It just controls all the other musical instruments. Cool. That's a really great way to put it. Thank you. Um, Adam, I guess I want to ask about, because we haven't talked about it a lot, but I want to, I want to ask about your, you know, what is it, assistant audio, assistant video technician on the national tour? What was, what did that, what was that like? Sure. Um, so we were a uh, crew of 12 and we were travel. I think we were 12. That sounds right. Um, and we were all over the United States um, and we were contracted with theaters um, just everywhere and they would bring in local crews. Sometimes they were uh, union crews, sometimes they were non-union crews, and sometimes it was a mix of both. Um, so for example, we, we would wind up going to some places and we uh, it would be like a question mark on our sheets that we would get ahead of time of like what everything looked like. And so we had no idea what we were walking into. And um, we actually went to one place in Texas that uh, the load in and load out um, crew was the college's football team. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, and and but it was a time. Um, and they also didn't have like a lift. So it was just these guys like beefing up these road boxes upstairs and things. It was a sight to see. Um, but, but for my specific responsibilities uh, was I was in charge of coordinating all of the um, frequencies for our wireless microphones um, and getting all of the wireless microphones prepped um, for the actors for the shows. And we were doing a bunch of one-offs, which means that we would arrive at a city, we would load into the venue, we would do the show that night, and then we would load out and leave and go to the next place, which was sometimes in a different state the next day. Um, so it was a very fast process. Um, and it was me and my uh, supervisor, I guess. Uh, and his name was Sam. He was the A1. I was the A2. Those were, you know, official titles. Um, and then we had the master electrician and then the E2. And so um, the E2 and I were both assistant video. So depending on how load-in was going that day for lighting versus sound, um, one of us would take over setting up everything for video because uh, the show that we were doing was Finding Neverland. And so there were a lot of projections um, that were being used. So we had two projectors that had to get set up um, and kind of scoped out and everything and figuring out how we were going to configure them for that day. Uh, and, and so it was, it's basically, I mean, again, my responsibilities were loading in all of the audio equipment, helping direct the local crews to have it set up the way that Sam and I needed, um, getting all of the microphones set up, and then monitoring those microphones during the actual show, making sure nothing looked weird or wonky. Um, part of it was also, I started to learn the mix. Um, so now we know what that is. So I started to learn the mix from Sam um, in case, you know, he ever got sick or anything, which he didn't. We actually got cut short on our tour in March uh, because everything, you know, started to close down, unfortunately, or before you know um and so uh that is a part of it as well kind of being able to to function as a swing um and then setting up video with the e2 cool so you have to again the creative component i mean you're not just taking something and setting it up the same exactly the same every time you no. have to go into a place no there's always surprises anybody who's ever been there. like there's there's no such thing as walking into a venue that you know on tour and it all being exactly how you were told it was so you're having to interpret the design that was given to you and then make adjustments right yes exactly yeah, yeah. wild yeah it's touring is fun but yes. wow it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Well, and since Adam kind of touched on it, Kate, I know you've gone on tours too, and you work with us as a lighting supervisor, or master electrician, somewhere in there. Can you, can you go over what that side of it does for us as well? Like at USF or out on tour or where they meet in the middle? <laughs> uh, let, let's try meet in the middle. Okay. <laughs> um, so on tour the title my tours gave me was touring lighting designer which is essentially the master electrician um, and it's basically we'll set up in a venue for a week to figure out the show and we'll have a lighting designer come in and do the initial design <laughs> and then once we start that and we start going on the road it like has been said it's my job to interpret the design and make it happen to the best of the ability within the venue constrictions. <laughs> um, but I mean, 
that also happens a lot. Yeah, we're going into a new place almost every day and adapting every single day, but we do that a lot like at USF over the summer. We get our designs from the designer and we just kind of have to go, okay, <laughs> I believe these are your intentions. We've talked about it a lot. I can't make that happen exactly, but this is the best I can do for you right now. And we have to, I mean, even though we're setting up a show in the space to run for a month or two, sometimes longer, you still have to adapt because a lot of the designers that we bring in, they're not on site until tech week when we actually start doing the programming and the designing. So all the setups up to our interpretation of conversations and paperwork that we, we receive. Can you talk a little bit about um, the title Master Electrician? Uh, what, what does that entail? What, what is a Master Electrician? Um, in my experience, it, I mean, it's always going to vary a little bit depending on the theater you're at because the hierarchies are always a little different. <laughs> um, most of my experience has been you're in charge of this space. So like at USF, I have typically been in the Randall when I was lighting supervisor um, and it's Danielle and Scott kind of would give me like here's your plot where we think the light should go here's all of this and then I format a lot of paperwork for the technician so they can understand and then kind of act as a crew leader to make sure that everything needs to happen actually happens lights get hung plugged in told what they're going to be <laughs> Um, make sure that any type of special effects we're doing, like the, again, the lights that were sh on the stairs of Joseph, make sure that happens and that's actually working and kind of delegate accordingly, <laughs> depending on the crew that I have. Um, and it's so, yeah, it's kind of like that step between the supervisor of the entire department and the individual crews for each space to make everything happen. Good. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I want to, I want to talk a little bit about the process for you all and, and maybe, you know, some personal feelings about like, what's your, what's sort of your favorite part? You know, we talked a little bit about what you're, what you do, but what part like really, really energizes you in the process? Um, Ryan, you, what, what are your thoughts about that? Um, I think my favorite part, honestly, what really energizes me is trying to figure out something that hasn't been figured out before, um, which we did a lot at USF. Um, it, it was a whole lot of, you know, we want this thing to happen, figure out how to make it happen. I was like, uh, okay, sure, we'll go with that. Um, and so I really like kind of putting together these, like, I guess you could say proof of concepts and then uh, seeing them through to uh, f uh, fully functional uh, ideas or some of them were s seen through to fully functional ideas. Some of them just failed. Miserably. You, you, um, we all smiled at that. We all went, ah, USF. Yes. <laughs> but uh, and the sacred world of technicians, everybody knew what we were talking about there, but a patron's going, why did they all smile at that? So are there any examples of, Hey, figure this out. And we don't know how to do that. What, uh, especially with the Ingolstadt, for example, and other things? Um, well, I mean, uh, let's see here. Where do, know, which one do I want to go with? Um, s s so the Ingolstadt was a very, I, I was there for the opening of that. Um, I, I, I uh, was one of the few people that have the uh, uh, ability to where they worked in the Adams and they worked in the Ingolstadt, uh, and which, which, which is pretty uh, fun. You know, I can uh, say that, but... Uh, and they were very, very different systems. We, we took a large technology leap forward uh, between uh, the Adams and the Ingolstadt. And so there was a whole lot of figuring out what to do. But I think the thing that made it the hardest was that the Ingolstadt was designed one way and it, was, it didn't seem like it was really designed with theater in mind, the audio system. It seemed like the person who originally designed it kind of designed it for a we'll call it a presentational type thing. It was basically kind of meant for like a speaker just standing in front of you talking about stuff is what uh, the audio system was kind of designed for. And when we started getting the plans for uh, all the systems in there, we started looking at it and going, this isn't 
going to work very well for theater. And so we started having to figure out, okay, well, if we uh, reroute this to over here, and if we do this, and if we move this piece of equipment here, that, uh, you know, we made it into what it is now, which is something like 40 uh, discrete uh, output channels of audio uh, throughout the theater. I can't quite remember. I lose count of that all the time. It just seemed like every, every year, every year we were just adding a couple more channels, couple more channels, couple more channels, and it just kept getting more and more complex. And it was fun. I love, it's it's also the death of me. I love adding complexity to uh, systems just because it just makes it so much more fun to figure out. Cool. <laughs> Great. Uh, any of the rest of you want to take that question on? Uh, yeah, where, I, I mean, he asked, you know, what is it you, why do you do it? What do you enjoy? I see you all nodding your heads. I mean, is it, is it the unsolvable problem that you solve? Is that what you live for? I, I have, uh, okay, well, I'll start, I'll start with my, I have two answers to this. Um, <laughs> the first one is, is the um, panic adrenaline rush is, is super real in this industry. And, and I feel, it's weird saying that because I feel like those words have an inherent negative you know, connotation to them, but it, it's so energizing um, to sit at a console and you know the show, you know, in, in an audio, you know, mixed position, you, you know the show, you have your script, even if you don't know the show, you know, you're going through it. And you just, uh, one of the things that, that I love about that position in particular is the, the sound can literally control the energy of your audience. Um, and, and they might not know if you, you know, don't bump the music to just the right level or something, but they might be able to feel it. And I think that that is so cool um, that, that they're kind of like in on it with you and you can kind of have those moments without anybody realizing that you're like, yeah, I just made you feel that way. Like, you know, it's, um, but, and, but also knowing, you know, the, and where that adrenaline comes in is like, but you know, if you, if you mess something up that you're going to make them feel a way that they're not supposed to feel in that moment. Um, and, and so for me, that's one of the things that I love the most about this job. Right. Eight? Uh, yeah, so I also kind of have two parts to that answer. <laughs> um, my favorite part in pre-production is figuring out things um, when we start doing things that are kind of unheard of, the same idea of you kind of have to make it work and figure it out, like the coat for Joseph that lit up. <laughs> we were given that and then had to integrate those systems that the costume department used with our systems that's a lot of fun for me because it's a lot of constant learning and I really enjoy that. Um, but the other thing I really enjoy is when I do get the rare opportunity to be just in the back of the audience or just outside when the audience is coming out and they, I mean, they know, they see you dressed in all black, they know you're one of the technicians and they just kind of stop you and they're like, that was amazing. Or I've had some tell me how that show changed their life and that like gratification from what we're doing means something to people and it's very important is just so satisfying and fulfilling wonderful um i want to uh i want to remind our uh patrons who are listening online uh i know you're really having a good time listening to them uh feel free to ask them any questions you want i think you might be a little terrified i don't know how to ask this question so feel free to just ask whatever question here uh, and i'll i'll start with one that i have um because you speak so many different languages, sometimes it's hard to speak to people who don't speak those languages. You know what I'm talking about? Um, and as, uh, as Richard was alluding to, um, you're sometimes at the bottom of the chain. So you don't get a chance to speak those languages back. And even if you did, even if you started talking Dante and Cobras and transducers, it wouldn't matter. Anyway. Um, so my favorite joke, my favorite joke, um, how, many how many technicians does it take to put in a light bulb? It's a lamp, damn it. Uh, <laughs> um, so we don't even know what or how to ask those questions. So how do you deal with the multiple languages and layers of communication that you have to, when you have to speak to people who don't speak those languages? I think for starters, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, I think for starters, <laughs> part of it is um, going through a mental process of trying to figure out what 
specificity is actually important to the conversation. Um, so, you know, if I'm sitting down with, with, you know, someone, I probably won't make a difference between light bulb or, or lamp, you know, if they're talking to me, but it, but it is having to be conscious of those things when you're reiterating information to the other person of, okay, they, I could say lamp or I'll just say light bulb here. And even though in the back of your head, you might be screaming, yeah, that's wrong. But like, <laughs> yeah, but, but to them, it, that's what's getting that communication across. Um, so, so I think it's, it goes back to like kind of what I said earlier of just being able to talk to someone like another human being rather than maybe two people at work, if that makes sense. Good, good, cool. Other comments? About that. Yeah, I'm probably the worst person about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people were usually confused when I was talking about uh, audio stuff around the festival um, that uh, that weren't in the audio or lighting department. Um, usually, I was the person that would always like you know say it how it is in my brain, and then when they give give me the deer in the headlights look, then I basically speak in almost pictographs and like you know just break it down to the simplest the simplest things like say this cable or this piece of equipment can't talk to this piece of equipment. So I need this piece of equipment to go between them and act as a translator or something like that. Instead of using all the proper terms saying, you know, I need, I need this to, you know, do that or, you know, so it, You're it's all kind smiling of the question. You've all been there, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. you've all, right. <laughs> Uh, it's why you're so important because you're also the only ones that can talk to the equipment, uh, you know, while, while the rest of us wanted to do things and you go, it doesn't do that, but we have to make that happen. Yeah. So, I love what you said earlier about how, you know, it's about, you know, communication and actually, you know, working with people. So cool. Yeah. As a director or someone is, is describing something to you and they go, you know, it's easy like this right um and 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 then there's the you know uh, all the experience and training and knowledge that then goes into translating that into reality you know um we've talked in a few of these sessions about and with designers about you know i, I present an idea to the technical staff and then the actual realization of it the the fulfillment of the creation happens with all of the all these other collaborators like it's not really the finalized piece of art until we add all of you, your, you know, your colleagues in other departments, the actors, like it's, it's just an idea and the uniqueness of our discipline with um, so many different layers and so many different skill sets that it, it, it grows and it changes and that you're as much a part of that chain of events to create that final piece as, you know, as the actors who are out on there getting, uh, you know, getting the applause at the end. Um, can you talk about, um, like one that you're really proud of, like something that you feel like your presence and your um, expertise really made the final product great and you're really proud of that. Kate, do you have anything uh, like that? Um, the favorite production I've ever worked on and it's just, it was one of those that I got the joy of building the production and then I didn't actually have to run it. So I got to sit in the audience and watch it. <laughs> um was Twelfth Night at Alabama Shakespeare Festival and it was one of those shows that we introduced a lot of LEDs which for them at the time you were only about half set up for <laughs> um so there was a lot of learning curve on doing where you're making one piece of equipment talk to something that doesn't really want to talk to <laughs> um but I just remember sitting in the audience, there's a moment where we had this whole shrew of laners hung at different heights, just kind of come in, just barely at a glow with the stage at a almost black while the scene change was happening behind there. And I just remember it taking my breath away. <laughs> so. Yeah, those moments still happen, even with all the theater, all the dark rooms we sit in, you know, you, you live for those. I always, I always say like, if every 10 or 15 shows I get a little, I get that little moment, it, it sustains me. So it's nice to hear how others have those, have those moments too. Um, do we want to talk a little bit about training um, and sort of like if you rec what would you recommend to people who want to try and, as Michael Barr has put it, become you? be Adam, Ryan, or Kate? Um, what kind of um, 
what kind of things, uh, you know, what should they pursue? What should they try to do? Uh, Adam? Um, so I have some, I have some theoretical things before I, before I guess, uh, literal things, because, you know, if there is anybody who's gonna watch this, uh, you know, and, and is like, yes, this is, this is inspiring. Uh, I want to reiterate the advice that was given to me, um, which, uh, I feel like this, these, these things can apply in all facets of life, but obviously, you know, I have applied them in this direction. Um, and, uh, shout out to my mom who's watching because she is the one who took me to meet this man who gave me this advice, um, like the lovely human being she is. Uh, so he told me three things. He was the technical director of New World Stages um, back in 2014 uh, in New York. And um, he told me that to succeed in this business, you need to do three things. And the first one is work as hard and as often as you can. The second one is if you make a mistake, own it. And the third one is have integrity. Um, and, you know, being 16, 17 and hearing that, I was like, okay. And I think, you know, I was, I was able to evaluate those things. And even as I, as I get older, you know, trying to reframe them and, and making them still apply to my life and, and moving forward, because I think that is true. I think part of the, the training for what we do is working a lot. It's taking those grungy jobs where we're sweeping a stage and maybe we're just like watching the lighting designer from across the room, you know, and, and hearing them uh, say things to their assistants or um, things like that. Um, and, and so just taking any and every job you can uh, to get started is, is I think, crucial. Um, and then again, like if you make a mistake, own it. I made so many mistakes when I was at USF and I had to go to Scott and be like, hey, so um, how do I dig myself out of this one? Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and it's awkward, but the more that you do it, the more you realize everybody does it. And so, you know, especially when we're dealing with things so based in science and technology, like technology is not flawless. Technology sucks. And it will, it will mess you up in your job every time. Like Ryan said, uh, and, and I think it was on during the recording, but it was like sound is so variable and like everything and anything can go wrong. Um, and sometimes that's on you and sometimes it's definitely not on you. Uh, so, you know, if you make a mistake, own it. And just having integrity, just being able to move forward day to day and, and being able to connect with people and just being honest. Cool. Kate? Um, I completely agree with that. <laughs> that is really good advice. Um, the other thing I would, the way I kind of got started in training for what it's like to be in professional theaters as opposed to the really small local community theaters that are around my hometown was I'd be like, oh, I'm driving through this town and they have the theater. And I would just email the theater two weeks in advance and be like, can I sit in the booth to see what this is like? And you would be surprised at how many of them go, yeah, sure, we can set you up a headset, it's fine. <laughs> and they'll let you sit in the idea of your learning and you're trying to see how things work to be, I mean, and that's something I still do today whenever I go to bigger cities. I'm like, hey, can I sit in to see if anything, like if you have any new ideas that I don't know about that could improve where I'm working. Um, and then the other thing is a piece of advice I got in college, because as much as I've moved around the country, people will believe this, but being away from my close knit family is very stressful for me. <laughs> um, but you can do anything for three months, which is an average summer contract. So if you want to jump in and try and do it. It might be awful, it might be wonderful, but you can accomplish anything in three months if you just put your mind to it and work hard. Cool, cool. Ryan? Um, you know, I'd say for like someone who, who's like in high school and thinks that they wanna go into technical theater that you kind of have to evaluate yourself first to kind of decide what pathway you wanna take. You know, I kind of, I kind of believe that there are two pathways that you could take. If you're the type that, um, that you're really good at self teaching yourself and you can figure stuff out really easy and uh, you can pick things up pre uh, on the fly pretty good. Then I say, you know, if you're looking at a college for technical theater, 
look for one that gives you uh, opportunities. Uh, that was the category that, uh, that I was in. Uh, I had always, you know, been able to pick up uh, technology and theater and stuff like that, you know, pretty, pretty readily. So I, I went to SUU, which was able to give me a whole lot of uh, opportunities to be able to apply those things and be able to learn new things, uh, sometimes on my own, sometimes, you know, with a teacher uh, uh, helping me along the way. But uh, if you're one of those people that, um, that aren't quite as good at self-teaching that really needs like, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, being able to say, do this, do that, then look for a, uh, a large program that has like, you know, also a grad school with it. You won't have like the opportunities really to like lighting design or anything like that, but you will have so many people around you that have already gone through the things that uh, you've gone through that can help uh, guide you through that. And then also, you know, uh, just getting any, you know, I think Adam uh, had talked about this, you know, getting any experience that you can whether it be sweeping a stage or whether it be, you know, just uh, dropping some uh, gel and lights and everything like that. Um, you know, it's, it's all useful. Um, even if you don't see how it directly applies to your job, it probably will. You know, with technicians, we have to be, you know, extremely flexible. You know, almost no one really wants to hire a technician that they just do one thing, you know, like a uh, uh, at USF, the electrics technicians would help uh, audio a lot of times and audio would help electrics a lot of times. And so you just kind of have to be flexible. And even though it may not pertain to the thing that you, that you really love, learn it anyway, just because it will be useful later on. And I just like to like interject on that is being willing to hop into other departments, like our electricians being able to jump onto sound and help them really fast. <laughs> speaks a lot to character, which in this field will actually get you a lot further than knowing everything. Like just being willing to go do that grunt work to help someone out, it, it follows you in a very good way. Cool. Danielle, you, were, you had something? I was just gonna say, I mean, I agree with everything that everybody is saying, um, but I have also found that a part of training that I, I personally wish that I had gotten more of before I got into the personal world or the professional world is um, just intercommunication between people. Like it's a very common misnomer that all of us are super antisocial and just want to live in our own bubble and whatever. And while that can be true and we need more space than other people, I have never walked into a theater where a crew was working and everybody wasn't having a good time. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's very important to also think about developing your ability to communicate and uh, just work with other people. And you just do that by working a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, it, we've, we've, I think that's important, this, this idea of being exposed to a lot of different things that you all have touched on. And the, um, as collaborators, learning interdisciplinary information, you know, understanding uh, just like we talked about the training being broad, having a musical background, having uh, science and math, having communication skills, understanding the work and being, a, you know, an artist and an artist advocate in your own right and understanding the content that we create is going to make you better. And, and this has come up before in, in other seminars where it's just like, just learn as much as you can as a human being. I mean, you're a, you're a citizen artist, to borrow a term, uh, and being an un understanding everybody that's working around you and that community, you know, chipping in when you're, uh, when somebody's down and you need to help maybe uh, push the giant scenic element that blew out a caster or, or whatever it happened to be, you know, coming together as a community. Um, and I'll lead, this leads into another question, but like one of the things that's been really hard besides our livelihoods being at stake during this crisis is the community that, I personally miss greatly, you know, all of you and being around and us and that energy of a collective art, you know, I admire sculptors and I admire, uh, you know, uh, portrait artists and painters, uh, but, but the reason this discipline was so appealing to me is because of each of you and those, those, those groups of people. Um, I, I, I wonder what, what you all see as, as how your field will change um, when we all come back from this. You know, what, what's gonna, what do you see is gonna be different? Are there things that you hope will be different as a second part of that? Um, does anybody wanna jump on that? 
Yeah, um, actually, I just had uh, an experience on Monday. That's what I've been uh, pretty busy with this week is uh, dealing with uh, this stuff. Um, so, I mean, one thing that has changed uh, in, in my job is that, you know, beforehand with shows uh, like live streaming or broadcasting, your show was basically just a no. It was basically a brick wall. You didn't go past that. Like, it didn't happen. Um, and now, because of the pandemic, you know, um, the, a lot of uh, uh, shows, the companies that hold the rights for them have uh, allowed, are allowing you to live stream stuff. And so live streaming is now in theater um, and I think it will honestly stay. Um, I think it'll be one of those things where it'll come out as a positive. Um, and so I think that's something that we have to learn a little bit more about is live streaming. I just, um, the school that I work at, we just, uh, uh, we've got most of the equipment in right now. Uh, still waiting on the cameras. They're back ordered because everyone else is buying cameras. Um, but, um, you know, we just uh, are starting to get all that stuff in. We're putting it together, uh, messing around with it, trying to get it all uh, figured out and everything. And, and it's something that, um, you know, we could sit there and go, you know, this is only going to be a one, two year thing that we'll be doing this, but I really don't think it is. Um, I, the music department at the school that I work for, they, um, for their uh, recitals, were averaging somewhere between like, you know, 20 and 30 people uh, for the recitals, just because it's kind of hard to get to, uh, you know, I, I live in California, in Southern California, around the Los Angeles uh, area, and that's where I work at, is in uh, Carson, California, and, um, you know, it's hard for people to get there and see those recitals. But, uh, you know, uh, the uh, end of last uh, semester, uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, they were doing uh, Zoom uh, for their uh, recitals and uh, live streaming and just these students just with their computers or uh, iPhones or whatever. And the attendance for these recitals was up over 200, whereas, you know, they had only had 20 to 30 previously. And so I think it's going to be a new way that we can uh, engage our audiences. And I don't think it's going to go away. I don't think it's going to be everything is going to be live stream because there are still, I, I I encourage you that when theater comes back to live where you can see live theater if you can see live theater see live theater in person sitting in a seat uh because there is something magical about it um that you just can't get that you can't translate through a screen but if you can't if you can't make it there and the live streaming option is uh, available then that's awesome too Thanks. Anybody have anything to add to that or any other? What the future looks like? Crystal ball? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, one thing uh, our arts department at, at St. Paul's has been talking about is, is basically this is forcing us to have some sort of new renaissance um, in the art world and that we don't necessarily know what the art that is going to come out of this is going to look like in terms of actual content plays and you know movies and and uh, anything you know along those lines sculptures paintings um because this is this was just such a, a cultural reset in a way that you know all of our mindsets have changed so much but um i definitely agree agree with ryan because you know now instead of you know, grandma and grandpa sending a, a text being like break a leg tonight you know they can tune in from north dakota and and watch the the little musical that that's going on which i think in that sense um which is so weird uh because we are so distanced but in, in a non-physical way it's bringing people a lot closer um and and something that i've i've found at least in my personal life is i found myself connecting with people who i maybe don't talk or haven't talked to as much before this. And now I'm making a point to reach out and be like, hey, we haven't talked in a while. Like, why don't we set up a FaceTime or, or a Zoom call? And I think that directly translates into our theater world now as well of like, we have the ability to draw in these people that maybe theater wasn't their thing before, you know? And, and now maybe they're looking for that thing that we might be able to fill. Cool. Kate, you wanna bring um, us through? I think a lot that's changed for me during the pandemic, it would be how much prep work we can do remotely. Um, so before the pandemic hit, a lot of the work, I would come into the space. I would go to wherever the space was that in the company that had hired me is. Um, and the first week or two, I would just be sitting at a desk doing paperwork, labeling things, getting stuff in order for when the crew arrived to actually implement. Um, and since the pandemic hit, a lot of that has been moved to 
you can stay over there. <laughs> we'll just send you the files. <laughs> and so I think that construct change of work is a thing, not a place. I think it's something that's really going to translate over dealing with that end of theater. Um, I mean, there are a lot of things that we're never going to be able to replace by being there in person, but I think we found a lot of ways to work around those with technology. Um, and I think a lot of those conveniences will stay kind of like what Ryan was talking about. Very cool. Thank you. I, I do have one more question if we have time. It's totally off topic and really light after that discussion. <laughs> but Scott would like to know, all of you work with sound. What would be your soundtracks if you had to pick a soundtrack to your life right now? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> In this particular like moment of life, what what's in the other instant score? instant of life where everything is just up in the air, what would your soundtrack be? Crazy train. <laughs> nice. Oh man. Uh Jimmy TNT. Uh, that's it. <laughs> I I don't have a particular song in mind, but anything highly chaotic could pretty much describe me right now. <laughs> Excellent. Wonderful. Wow. Uh, what a great hour this has been. Really, really, really fabulous. Uh, I want to thank you for, uh, first of all, all of your great work at USF. Again, we started the hour by saying we wanted to celebrate uh, people who we don't necessarily see. We could not do our jobs here at USF without everything you just talked about, you know, being able to solve the problems that none of us know how to solve and that we throw manuals at you and you just, there is no manual and you just have to figure it out. And that uh, great work ethic and the skill which you bring and uh, your experience and then that added experience that you learn, we're just really grateful. And USF would not be the place uh, as a training ground that it is and also as a producer of art that it is without your expertise and, and what you've brought. So we're just very, very grateful for this. Um, Richard, do you have anything you wanna add before I do our final out? Sure, no, thanks, Michael. I think you're exactly right. I mean, I'm, I'm so thankful to meet all of you. Most of you, this is the first time I've got to talk to you. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I know a little bit about what you do, enough to be dangerous. Um, so I'm so thankful for each of you uh, that add your part to it. Like I said before, the the opportunity to expose all the layers to our art form and to show people just a little taste of the complexity of your journey and your artistry. Um, I'm so thankful for it. Thank you so much for joining us. And thanks Danielle for helping me talk with them and uh, your daily assistance with my knowledge gap. Uh, is, I cannot under, I cannot overstate the importance of it. So thank you all. Yeah, good. Uh, next week, we're very excited because we're going to be talking about a very unique thing here at USF called the Shakespeare competition. It's been running since 1977. And we are having, they're all nodding their heads because you've all been here when thousands of students, literally 3000 students come and participate in the Shakespeare competition. And uh, you also helped kind of put that thing together. Uh, we're doing it virtually this year, but we've got four artists that are going to be talking to us next week about why they come back year after year to participate in the Shakespeare competition. So join us next week at 11 o'clock and we look forward to having you there. Special thanks again to our great sponsors, Cedar City Bryan Head Tourism Bureau, who we would not be able to offer this without. Uh, and it's lovely here. Uh, I'm not sure what it's like where any of you are, but fall in Cedar City is great. The hotels and restaurants are open here and uh, canyons are gorgeous. The fall leaves are starting to turn. It's really beautiful. So thank you. The conversation will continue online. We're actually going to put this on YouTube so you can watch it there as well. You can also follow us on Facebook. Just go to bard.org and right down to the bottom of the page, virtual festival. Uh, you'll find a whole bunch of other things that we're talking about, other conversations that we have. We'd love to have you join us for those as well. So thank you very, very much. Thank you again and God bless. Uh, thank you.